Hey guys, welcome back to our channel. It's a girl funny lungu back with another reaction video. If you're new to this channel, make sure to give this video a thumbs up, share it with your friends, and of course, do not forget to, to subscribe. Um, today I'm going to be reacting to the good news that came out of France. So without wasting time, let's get into the video. Hey. They came to him, okay, you claim to be a prophet, give us a miracle. And the prophet is hesitant because you shouldn't believe because of miracles. But eventually he said, okay, what do you want? He said, if you claim to be a prophet, see that full moon there? Split it in two. Make one go to that side and one go to that side. Then bring them back together and join them and we'll believe you're a prophet. So the prophet prayed to Raka Salah and said, Ya Rab, they're asking for miracle. Jibreel came, the celestial bodies are in your control. Order, it will be done. So the prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam pointed with his blessed fingers and the moon ripped apart and one went to that side and one went to that side and then he Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam brought it back together and it touched and rejoined and the miracle was seen as far as in India and one of the pious men of India seeing it traveled in the direction until he reached Mecca after many months and a while in hearing of a prophet he came to him and he said I saw that miracle there in India and I have come here testifying to your prophethood. The miracle in the life of the prophet started before his birth. The Prophet ﷺ is a young lad. His uncle takes him on a trip to Syria. Now in the southern parts of Syria, there's a city called Basra in those days. And in that city, there's a monastery, like an old church on a hilltop. And in that church was an elderly Christian monk. The Arabs used to call him Bahira, the monk. Near that place was a little oasis or a little lakes. Now Bahira is sitting on the hilltop in his monastery and he notices there in the horizon a caravan coming. And on top of this caravan he noticed a low-lying cloud. It is scorching hot, the heat of the desert. But this caravan seems to be concealed and covered and shielded and protected from the sun by the slow laying cloud. And then he noticed that if the caravan moves to the right, the cloud moves to the right. And if the caravan moves to the left, the cloud moves to the left. And when the caravan stops, the cloud stops. So Bahira sits up, like what is this? And being a spiritual man, he sees the spiritual significance that there must be some great personality there. So he pays special attention to the caravan. And when the caravan comes and parks under a tree, Bahira notices that the tree moves down a bit over them to give extra shade. And why wouldn't it? The future prophet of Allah was to be seated under it. Years later, the prophet is in Medina. And when the prophet وسلم, came to Medina, they built a masjid. When the prophet وسلم, used to speak, there was a tree, like a palm tree, he used to lean on when he used to speak. Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Then one of the people came to him. They said, Ya Rasulullah, don't you think we should build a pulpit for you to stand on and speak so people can see you? So the Prophet said, do as you please. So they built a member for him on that side. And when the member is built, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam next week came and stood there and spoke. So he left the tree and as he started to speak and they say, Wallahi, we heard the tree sobbing like a baby crying, sniffling, as in 
now that they built you a culprit, you left me. So the Prophet wasallam came down, walked back to the tree and started to uh, rub it to say, I'm still here. And the Sahaba say, the tree became silent. Now we are at the battle of Khandaq. 10,000 plus all of the inhabitants of the Arab Peninsula came in one army to eradicate the little city of Medina. So the Muslims thought what to do. So they decided we will dig a trench around the city so that the army cannot cross into the city. So the Muslims got busy and started to dig and the heat is scorching and the Muslims are digging this huge trench. And the Ashab are digging day in, day out. Some of them say for three days we had very little or no food. As they're digging they came to a huge rock inside the path of the trench. So they called the Prophet ﷺ, Ya Rasulullah, this rock is stopping the progress. Come look at it. So Jabir radiallahu anhu says, because the Prophet came and I saw him walking like with weakness and tired and fatigued and hungry. And when he came, I saw that we had one rock on our tummies. He had tied three on his. Jabir radiallahu anhu saw the state of the Prophet and it hurt him a lot. So he came to the Rasul and he said, Ya Rasulullah, give me permission to go home. So the Prophet said, granted, go. So Jabir radiallahu anhu went home to his wife. And he said, listen, I have just seen the Prophet in a way that my eyes cannot see him. Do we have anything at home to, to cook and prepare for him? So the wife said, we have a bit of barley. And we have that little goat or that little sheep. So Jabir radiallahu anhu says, Okay, you fix the bread. I'll get the meat ready and we'll cook it. And I'll go and invite the Prophet. So the wife tells him, says, Go invite the Prophet, but tell him quietly. So that other people don't hear and don't feel bad that they're missing out on food. So Jabir radiallahu anhu came quietly to the trench and next to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and he whispers in his ear, says, Ya Rasulullah, my wife and myself have prepared some food for you. So come with a handful of the Ashab to our house. So the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam hearing this stood up and he said, or people of the trench and in one qawl there is 3,000 men on the trench. So the Prophet stands up, he goes, O people of the trench, we are invited to the house of Jabir. And Jabir radiallahu anhu says, he goes, no one knew the shame that I was feeling except for Allah. So the Prophet seeing his anxiety says, Jabir, tell your wife not to start baking the bread until I come nor put the meat on the pot until I come. So Jabir picked up his clothes and ran back home. And he tells the wife, wow, calamity. So she says, what happened? He goes, the whole khandaq is coming. <laughs> so the wife says, I told you a handful. He says, it wasn't me, it was the Prophet. So she says, did you say it or did he say it? He said, no, the Prophet said it. So then she goes, what are you worried about? He knows what he's doing. So the Prophet wasallam came to the house. And what an honor to have the Rasul of Allah at your house. He sees the dough and the meat and he prays and blesses it. And then he tells her, start cooking. He told Jabir, Jabir, stand by the door and let 10 people in at a time. So Jabir radiallahu anhu is standing by the door and he says, so 10 people would go inside and they would eat, sit with the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and when they're full they would come out. So Jabir would say, have you had enough? Like did you actually get to eat anything? 
And they go, Alhamdulillah, ni'mah, like we were full. So then he goes, okay, ten more. And Jabir is scared all the way through because, you know, it's going to run out now, it's going to run out now. And he says, and I came into the house and wallahi, the bread was the same as it was and the meat was the same as it was. But the greatest and everlasting miracle of the Prophet is the sacred Qur'an. Every Prophet's miracle ended at his time and our Prophet's time is till Qiyamah come. So his miracle lasted till Qiyamah come. And let me, and although you won't appreciate it at your age, but the academia are here and perhaps they will understand it better. Let me talk on one of the miracles of the Qur'an. Our world was created from a big bang. This is the scientific understanding. Everything that we see, the sun, the moon, the stars, the celestial bodies, were all joined together in one little ball, like super dense, squashed up, almost zero volume. And it was all clustered like that together, and then a big bang. And it exploded, and everything went apart and slowly joined back together so you have the sun and the moon and so on. And this became a scientific fact, I think, in the early 90s. I went to uni and I became educated and studying. I found, subhanallah, the Big Bang, which was established in my lifetime, 14 and a half centuries ago, on the tongue of a Bedouin, the Prophet. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, on the verse of the Quran, Do not the unbelievers see that the heavens and the earth were all joined together, and we made them explode asunder or apart, and from water we created everything living. The big bang to the dot 14 and a half centuries ago on the tongue of a man in the desert. Sallu an Nabi. Poetry was the, was the word of the day. You know, they used to write a few verses of poetry, go put it on the Kaaba and say challenge. So someone else would come and try to write the next verse. And then the poet himself would give his own verses. It was competition. And because of poetry, some tribes would get elevated. It was their measure of excellence. So the Quran came and it gave the challenge, give 10 surahs like it. They tried, but they couldn't. The Prophet ﷺ, when the verses was Sama'i Dhatil Buruj came, he gave it to the Sahaba. He goes, Go put this on the Kaaba. Was Sama'i Dhatil Buruj. Go put this on the Kaaba. This is our challenge. Give us the next verse. So one of the poets came and he saw this. He goes, Oh, this is easy. And he ran home. You know, took pen and paper and started to write, like, you know. What's next? Eventually he came, he wrote it down and he stuck it on the, on the Kaaba. And this is what the poor soul had written. Women are creatures with private parts. This was his poetry in comparison to there's no, and the Arabs themselves looked at it and go, oh, no, what, what, what an embarrassment. <laughs> and others tried. Well, one of the classic ones uh, is Musaylima. Musaylima claimed prophethood. So he said that Allah has revealed to that prophet and he's revealed to me as well. So we are dual prophets. So he came to, to Amr ibn al-As. Amr ibn al-As is one of probably the most sharpest minds amidst, you know, in Arab history. A diplomat, a astute politician, a thinker, a strategist, uh, Amr ibn al-As radiallahu anhu arda. You know, he's the type of man that will look at you and see through you. You know, you, there, there's little you could hide from, from Amr ibn al-As. So Musaylima came to him and he said, what's the latest that's been revealed on the, on the Prophet of Hijaz? Amr ibn al-As is not a Muslim at this stage. Amr ibn al-As said, he goes, I think it's, inna a'taynaka al-kawthar, fasalli li rabbika wanhar, inna shani'aka huwa al-abtar. 
So he goes, something similar is revealed upon me. So he said, uh, what's revealed upon you, Ya Musaylim? So he said, the surah of Tufah, apple. So he goes, read it to me. So he said, Inna a'atainaka tufah. Fasalli li rabbika wartah. Wada' anka siyah. Verily, we have given you the apple. So pray to your Lord and relax and forget about your worries. So Amr ibn al As is Amr. You know, Amr, Amr is no child. So he said, uh, has, has a second one, has anything else been revealed, Musaylim? He goes, now. Nah. He goes, because to our Prophet Allah Rabbul Izza revealed, Alam tara kayfa fa'ala rabbuka bi ashab al-feel. So he figured, feel is the catch word here, let's do this one. So he goes, al-feel ma al-feel. Wa ma adraka ma al-feel. له خرطوم طويل وذيل قصير because elephant or elephant and what do you know of an elephant it has a long trunk and a short tail so Amr looked at him and said يا مسيلمة والله إنك لا تعلم والله you know O مسيلمة that I know that you're a liar hold on you see Normally you tell people, you, say, you know you're a liar. Yeah, that's one level. But Amr says, I know you know you're a liar. But you know that I know you're a liar. And you're still going like shameless. very interesting video i feel like he contradicted himself at some point because when he came to talking about the french people he said not all french people are bad or not all french people can do this and that but then when he came to christians and jews he's saying he said he didn't say some christians or some jews he just said these people may not accept you because you don't believe in their religion which is wrong people should learn to say some of this some of the Christians, some of the Jews, so that we don't get confused because that's now like putting a title. It's like saying uh, Muslims don't like anyone else or Muslims don't like anyone else that belongs to another religion, which doesn't make sense. Others will love you despite whatever you believe in. And this conversation was quite nice, but then I'm a little confused. What exactly happened in France? What did they do? Were they trying to tarnish Muhammad's uh, image or what? And I remember some years back there was another incident in incident in France I've just forgotten what it was about but that being said I really like what he was saying learn to boycott things when you feel like you're being oppressed these all these Western countries know that we the people from other countries are, are actually the reason why maybe the um, the economies are good because we keep going there for um, vacations you name it just all sorts of things but if you feel oppressed feel free to peacefully protest whatever is going on until you're respected this was very this was a very very interesting conversation make sure to give this video a thumbs up share it with your friends and of course do not forget to subscribe and i'll see you in my next reaction video